story and um, the inspiration that she is. So Sarah is um, the first guest that I've been able to talk to in the third episode of our Coke Scholars podcast called SIP. Scholars Night podcast. And Sarah is uh, has just this incredible story and has done all this amazing work. And so I'm excited. We're going to give you a little bit of a preview and talk to you about, um, about her story, her journey, and some of what you're going to get to hear in a little bit of a preview from um, that Coke Scholars SIP podcast that is actually out now. It came out last week. Um, and like I mentioned, we are doing something new here. Uh, we are broadcasting both live on Instagram and on Facebook. So the amazing Lauren is masterminding between behind the scenes on all of this. Um, so we're, we're trying to get all the bugs worked out, but I think we've got it there. We are virtually in so many Instagram, internet, World Wide Web's places. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little nerve wracking. It is a little bit, but you know, there's nothing that could go wrong with two scholars <laughs> from the 90s. No. Uh, we were the generation that sort of, you know, we had to learn how to code a little. I learned a little bit of coding. Did you? Did you ever yeah. do like the really yeah. basic HTML? Yeah. yeah. And GeoCities? Oh, yeah. Geo <laughs> yeah. Okay. So for my original Coke scholars, GeoCities was. Um, I don't even know how to describe it, but if you were online, you had a GeoCities page. Today, it would, uh, you know, at, probably ask your parents about it. <laughs> they, weren't, they, they weren't the best, but. So Sarah is joining us from um, Pella, Iowa. And Sarah and I got to talk about her journey in this podcast and um, really all the incredible work that she's done um, throughout her life to make so many changes. And part of the inspiration behind that, of course, is her incredible family. So Sarah, first, I want to talk about something that struck me. Um, and I've, I've heard this from a couple of Coke scholars over the last couple of years. And I think you and I both coming from the Midwest, um, I was raised in Nebraska. Um, I'm living in South Dakota now. Um, you know, our journey, our home is here. And that's where we've made that change. And I, I sometimes hear from scholars, well, I'm not from a big city. I didn't, you know, I'm not from New York and I'm not from LA. And I'm, you know, and I decided to go to a, a state school that's, you know, maybe not everybody knows the name. So should I even be a Coke scholar? Um, and that always strikes me as, um, you know, Coke scholars are picked to make change where the heart of their world is. And I think you speak to that. So Take me back to 1996. What um, what graduating Sarah's life goals were? Where do you think you were going to be? You didn't think you were going to be on Instagram and whatever else was going to exist, right? <laughs> no, and I sort of came back to that same feeling once again today. Like, why does someone want to care for me? <laughs> so um, yeah, I grew up in a town of about I think 2,000 people. Is the sound okay? Yep, you sound great. Okay. 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 Kind of weird kind of having weird these two screens, screens here. here. <laughs> so, grew up so in a small, small town, small and uh, you know, was a busy yeah. 17, 18 year old who had huge dreams, but not really sure I what, I what I wanted to do with my life. My life. I'm and still not still sure, not but um, yeah, I just was not <laughs> expecting a Coke Cole scholarship by any means. I had. I, I just didn't, uh, I think, believe in myself to the extent that I probably should have. And I think that's true of a lot of us. You know, we belittle what we are capable of. And that Coke Cola scholarship was that one thing that sort of catapulted me to the next level of thinking that, you know, you are worthy and uh, the work that you're doing is important. And no matter where you're at, whether that's small town Iowa or Nebraska or big city New York. So, uh, for sure, that statement resonates with me very much so. What would you say to those scholars out there that are thinking that way or feeling that way of, um, you know, I come from a small town. I, I'm choosing to go to a school that isn't a big name and it isn't an Ivy League. What would you say to them? Uh, you grow where you're planted. And uh, if you water it and make it grow, it's important. And you don't know what it's going to become. And 
Uh, that's definitely been the case in my journey uh, in so many different facets of life, not just work, uh, but how you can help others across the country or the world. So, and we've seen that with our journey and how it helped others in other countries even. So. Now, before we get to the work that you've done to advocate for rare disease, for SMA, and, and of course, kids like Stella and families like yours, I want to talk a little bit about something that you took on fairly recently um, and something you said to me about a month ago. And that was um, that you are an EMT and you went through that whole process. Um, and when we talk about it here in a minute, your daughter, Stella, has um, a compromised immune system. I think yep. you, you know, you use the, the phrase medically fragile. Um, yep. Yep. And you and I talked about the fact that, you know, with coronavirus and everything coming up, you know, the decision you made to still go out and go on calls as an EMT. Um, and what you said to me was, that's what I signed up for. And so how do you how do you weigh that decision of um, going out and helping others um, and also knowing, you know, what's going on at home? Yeah, absolutely. It was a huge decision and it was one I didn't take lightly, especially with um, her and how the rest of my family felt about my decision, because I do need to include them in that decision. So um, I felt so called to become an EMT that I felt that why would I be called to that at such a time as this and be pulled away from it? So I think it's just the passion I had for the work and knew it was important and just take professional steps at home to keep my family safe. So let's talk about your family. Let's talk about Stella's story, her journey. And I tease this on, on my own pages. We're going to talk about 4-H goats. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. At some point, I promise, we're going to get to 4-H goats. I know everyone's going, 4-H goats, but no. What is it's, that? It, what, is that? What, is what is that? No. Um, and, and we'll do the 4-H pledge too here in a minute. But oh, um, nice. Well, okay, well, we'll quiz both of us, see if we know it. Um, but tell me about um, tell me about SMA, Stella's journey, um, and, and the work that's just been absolutely amazing that you've been inspired to do. Yeah, so yeah. just as any journey is, we were not expecting to be gifted with this beautiful little blessing that had SMA. SMA is muscular atrophy. It's the childhood version of... ALS, ALS, essentially. So we were told when she suddenly lost her muscle tone at one month of age, take her home and love her. There's nothing you can do. And uh, we were just to prepare for her to pass. And um, she lost all her muscle tone for the most part. Uh, she was still breathing on her own and didn't need help that way. She was still eating on her own, but we knew those two things would also come along with the disease. So we went home and started researching uh, to find others that were living beyond the weeks or months prognosis. And my husband and I are both stubborn and figured out, well, this is definitely something that we need to try. So I couldn't live with myself if we didn't try absolutely everything, of course, just like any mom. And so we frequented a lot of different doctors, had to find the right doctor. It's okay to always go for a second opinion on things uh, because doctors aren't the end all know all on everything. They're human, just like us. So we found the right people. It was important to find the right team, someone that was going to advocate along with us. And while she's a blip on their screen and she's our whole life, they were still willing to walk alongside us and do the best we could. Uh, to help her out. So she comes with a whole host of equipment. She's now 13 years of age. So she was far outlived that week's or month's prognosis. And I have a teenager. Uh, so, Which I'm going to need advice on. I think I need advice on a three-year-old, let alone a teenager. <laughs> you just wait. You just wait. So, But I love seeing her sassiness come out and it means that she's still with us. So um, it has definitely been a journey. We've had ups and downs with surgeries that haven't gone right, or um, we've had to fight for different pieces of equipment. I've actually had to justify different pieces of equipment and why it was important that she had it when others felt that, why are you even 
doing this with the remaining time you have left with her. So it has definitely been a journey along the way um, that we have been equipped with wonderful people that have come alongside us and, uh, you know, the right people in the right place at the right time and just uh, keep trudging forward one foot at a time sometimes. Uh, keep trudging forward one foot at a time sometimes. All right, so now let's talk about, let's first of all, okay, do the 4-H pledge. Do you still remember it? I pledge my head to clear thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hand to larger service, my health to better living for my club, my community, my country, and my world. There you go. Yay. <laughs> I'm like a third generation 4 h -er, and um, I was always reminded uh, by generations, what, two and one or one and two, that they, they didn't get the world part. So, you know, we always oh, made okay. but yeah, that they didn't have it. I was like, okay. I can't one. believe I just remembered that. But. <laughs> That's impressive. You did. You did very well. Um, <laughs> tell me about, okay, people are going, why are they talking about 4-H? Of course, they're from, you know, farm country, which we are. But um, why uh, why we're talking about goats? Tell me this goat story. So, so a year ago, a year Stella ago, decided that she wanted to go at, at the fair. And... Knowing Stella, the amount of strength that she has is really in her fingers, movement in her head and shoulders. And so for her to show a goat seems like quite an undertaking. And first of all, I knew nothing about goats. I was raised on a pig farm. My husband knows um, something about cattle. But in terms of goats, that was not anything I knew about. So... Uh, but but you had uh, but you had the livestock there. range. You were just you know you had some range in there. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. You just didn't know the goats. <laughs> absolutely. But as it has been with her, you know, with everything she's encountered, we haven't just automatically said nope, we're not doing it. It's always been is there a way that we can make this happen? And so, long story short, my husband actually crafted a sidecar that goes along the side of her wheelchair, and so that the goat's front feet could go up on this little sidecar, and Stella could show the goat around the ring. And we looked into it; it was totally legal. We got um, an exemption with uh, her disability to be able to do this. And uh, yeah, she showed at the fair. So she goes to the fair. We've got this goat who wins her class. And so they bring her back to go up against the next class and she wins again and again. And she actually ended up winning the supreme female goat. <laughs> and uh, it was pretty exciting. It was a very amazing day for her and for our family to see her out there doing something that was just like everyone else in a little bit of a different way, but just like everyone else. And it was just a wonderful day. So it was then um, a little, yeah, it, it didn't become so much fun uh, for the weeks and, and months following that because long story short, apparently the fact that she won upset somebody else because she showed in a little bit of a different way. So I guess the fact that she is disadvantaged and, and used her situation to kind of manage to win is how they thought, I don't know. But long story short, we got a letter in the mail, anonymous, uh, saying that they were very disappointed that we would allow our daughter to show at the fair in this way. And that clearly she's unable to do all the work uh, you know, lifting of feed buckets and water buckets and uh, any of us that are in knows that it's a family affair. So she has two brothers that were very much involved in helping make this a goal for her. And uh, it was a really amazing experience for her. It just had some really sour lemons that we had to make some lemonade out of. But just as her story goes, it's amazing how many people it ended up touching because even though we had you know, the few naysayers, we had a consortium of people that came alongside us who said, go Stella, this is awesome, so glad to see you being as independent as you can, doing what your friends want to do. And we had families reach out, SMA families even from across the world. And one in particular, I'll never forget, I got a message from her, she lives in Pakistan. And in her message, she said, 
Thank you so much Thank for you. making lemonade out of lemon because with your story, it made me realize that my son too can do things and he never leaves the house at present other than to go to the doctor's office. And I may not let him show a goat, but we may actually go do some more fun things. So it was really exciting to see it inspire others who maybe hadn't thought outside the box to do things with their child that's medically fragile. And so that was really fun to see from quite a variety of things. And we got a couple questions here. So Casey, you want to know, how do I go about applying to Koch Scholars? Well, we love people to ask that question. Um, you need to be a high school senior or a rising high school senior. And if you go, um, if you go online, we'll, we'll post that link, but it's just an online application. And I believe they open up here in the next month or so. Um, someone I'm sure will text me and correct me if I'm wrong on that, but um, it's an online application initially. Uh, and then there are two interview stages as well. And we got to, the last time I saw Sarah in person, we actually got to surprise um, Fez, who is a 2020 Coca-Cola scholar. We brought in Coke trucks from our good friends at Atlantic Bottling. And we had the massive, you got to hold the big check, the good <laughs> big check um, um, that he, uh, he was a 2020 scholar, which was so awesome um, as well. So Casey, thank you for your question. Also, if you DM, um, if you DM us as well, we'll make sure somebody follows up with you with the right link so you can learn more about it. And hopefully you can be part of the Coke Scholars family soon. Carolyn said, and yes, Carolyn, you're right. Stella is on student council. I love this. <laughs> it was about a year ago, and <laughs> close to a year ago, and we were in Des Moines, and you said, oh, yeah, you know, Stella's on student council. And I was like, Stella's on student council? And I just, I love this. Okay, so she's showing goats, um, and I may add, she's getting headlines for the goat showing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Making headlines there. Um, she is, for anyone um, that uh, watches at uh, the Iowa State, you guys have been up for the wave during the football games. Yep. Yep. Seeing, um, doing pictures in that from the Children's Hospital. But the most incredible thing, one of the most incredible, I should say, the list grows and grows, is um, is she's on student council, too. And everything you do, I think, is such a, a family event. Um, but <laughs> When when the student council thing came up, you have to tell me, what were you thinking? Yeah, yeah. we brought that application home and I thought, oh, so I don't know about this. And I was kind of disappointed in myself for feeling that way. But she just really wanted to do it. And she's a girl that when she decides she's going to do something, she's going to do it. She might get that from her mother. But um, she brought it home. And you have to keep in mind that Stella is nonverbal. She cannot vocalize due to muscle weakness. So everything is done through a computer system, an IG system that uh, she can uh, vocalize that way using her eye gaze system or through prodding her with a lot of questions to get to the right answer. So filling out an application is an extensive process for her because we have to ask the right questions to get the right answers and figure out, you know, what it is she wants to list on there. And so I didn't know how this was going to go, but I thought, okay, we'll go for it. And the next thing you know, she, she was, Listen on a student council, her her teacher, I had said, I don't know about this. You know, maybe we should pull her application. And she looked at me so disappointed. She's like, hey, are you putting me? If her peers want her student council, she will be on student council. And so she's on student council. She absolutely loves it. It's a highlight of her day that she gets to meet with her peers and they get to make decisions on events and um, outreach and service. And so it's really wonderful to see that in action. It's I, every time I think, oh, my gosh, I'm going to see Sarah and there's going to be something amazing or I'm not technically on Facebook. Um, but my husband's on Facebook. He does all the creeping for me. And every so often he'll come up and be like, guess what Stella did or guess what Sarah's doing? Um, and it's just it's amazing to me because I think and I said this initially, I think this is one of the things that um Coke scholars sometimes lose sight of, and, and it's either in the moment, right, when you get the scholarship and you're in that weekend and you are surrounded by these absolutely incredible people, um, or it's after the fact when um, 
you know, you kind of look back and go, well, I, I haven't been, you know, I haven't been in Congress and I haven't cured cancer and I haven't done all of these things and everyone else has done it, but me. And, um, but you, you make change to your point, you make change where you're planted. Um, yeah. yeah. And did you ever think about moving somewhere else, living somewhere else? Um, you know, was, was Pella ever not home for you? Yeah, I actually moved to Des Moines. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I did think about moving other places and uh, heard other places calling my name, but it's just the way the journey went, and that's okay. You know, I had an incredible opportunity to study abroad when I was in college, and I strongly recommend that to anyone. I think it's really cool that a lot of other countries take a gap year to figure out what it is they you know, they, they learn so much about themselves. And I learned a lot about myself too while I was there. And I'm really thankful for having had that opportunity because I think even if you are in rural Iowa, it's important to get out. And um, even if you come back, it's so important to get out and see the rest of the world, of course. So if you could travel anywhere, okay, I, and I realize kind of the context of the question, let's we'll remove it from... Uh, <laughs> pandemic quarantine world, um, travel anywhere, where would you go? So I would probably want to go to Australia. Um, I visit a lot of Europe, but I think I'd really like to check out Australia. Australia's on the list. Yeah. Um, oh, ugh. Um, <laughs> now you turned it on me. This isn't fair. Um, <laughs> You no, know, I've never been to Europe. We were, you know, I think Australia would be would be great. Um, if you want inspiration of like amazing places in the United States to travel to, um, follow Kate Sullivan's amazing show to dine for, um, where she gets she travels all over the country and and I think the world is is she's opening her borders up on that one. And you see some of the most incredible places to eat and hear these incredible conversations as well. Um, and so, yeah, I, yeah, probably somewhere in Europe. I, you know, um, yeah, I'd go with that. Holly, <laughs> Holly. Okay. I, I don't know what I just did there. Holly. Um, <laughs> Holly is a originally a South Dakota Coca-Cola scholar. I'm going to get her journey right here at some point. Um, Holly then went to Iowa and then to Chicago and now Florida um, and is uh, a JAG. But Holly just made a comment, too, that she was able to study abroad. Uh, oh, through an opportunity through Central College in Pella as well. Nice. I just love that. Right, Pella. People are like, I don't know where Pella is. Well, if you have Pella windows. Yeah, you yeah. see the world through Pella. Um, but, you know, even though you can be in a small community, there's so many opportunities there to see see the world. Yeah, I actually used to work for the study abroad program. You know, I wonder if I was your advisor. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, wait, Holly will comment if it was you or not. Um, oh, I, Carolyn had a, a great question. So you also do photography mm -hmm. um, and you do you do family photos and newborns, you do a lot of amazing stuff. How have you had to shift that um, with with the, the time right now around um, coronavirus and the pandemic? Um, have you had to, to pivot in that? Yeah, it's really interesting because, you know, people are doing all four sessions and that sort of thing. Um, I have done some sessions with a mask on. Uh, and one of the things that's near and dear to my heart is the now I let me down to sleep photography of going into the hospitals and photographing newborns that don't get to come home. So I feel very passionate about that. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a balance. Um, you know, I have to keep out an eye out for my own family. Uh, I'm not doing a lot of sessions right now. I think a lot of people are kind of just realizing they're just going to have to wait a bit. So it's so interesting because I've had to take kind of a step back from that, but yet I'm riding in the back of an ambulance with potential COVID patients. So it's really kind of a mixed bag there and uh, a balance for sure. So can you, and I, I always get just a little bit, I think it catches me when you talk about um, the, the now you lay me down photos mm -hmm. and um, probably even more so being a mom and what that must mean for those families. But um, for people that, that don't know what that is, and I will try and not, and I, I've met families for whom this means everything to them. 
Um, but talk about being what it is and what it must be like to be in someone's uh, best and worst moment that you're capturing. Yeah, I feel like I'm in some of the worst moments of people's lives by being in the back of an ambulance at times or uh, being there in the hospital with those families. It's such an it's, it's such an intimate uh, thing that they're allowing me to be a part of. And again, I feel like life shapes you. And had I you know, known that this is what I would be doing 20 years ago, I would have said, no, no way. Um, but it's really an honor to be allowed into those places with those people and know that you are giving them a gift that they really can't, that really can't be replicated. So, and so uh, families invite you in. Um, and I think in the cases that I've seen it or been around, it's, um, it's been oftentimes a NICU or high risk pregnancy and um, the baby doesn't make it. Yep. Um, yep. And it's you're so important. that family baby. And um, some of them never look at the images, but they know they have them. And that's so important to them that they know they're there when they're ready to look at them and to really document that that, that little human was, was here and uh, is part of their family. So super important. I remember meeting a family and it's probably been 10 years ago now. Um, and they, um, their little boy lived for 11 minutes. And mm -hmm. you know, they talked about how for those entire 11 minutes, he was held in his parents' arms um, and that they had pictures and they had these incredible pictures. And it just strikes me, it strikes me the courage, and maybe that's not the word I'm looking for, the strength, the faith that it must take for you uh, mm -hmm. to walk in there and, and be in that moment. And yeah. as a mom, like, do you ever think about Stella too, knowing what you were told? Yeah. Absolutely. So I think part of my passion for it comes from the fact that we were able to take her home and uh, and do all these things with her that I know those families aren't going to get to experience. And so, you know, the biggest thing that you always have to look at in your life when it comes to tragedy and given a, a bad diagnosis is that you're not the only one that's dealing with um, a tragedy. And so many walk some rough moments in their life. And, um, you know, it's what you do with it. And if there's a way that I can reach out to others and help others because of the prognosis we've been dealt, then so be it. I will say the very first, now I let me down to sleep call I got, I, I walked in there and I burst into tears as soon as I introduced myself. But, you know, I think that family knew, okay, she's real, <laughs> but I could barely get through my name and um, started crying with them. So, um, again, it's just an honor to be allowed to go in and, and, and do that for them. And yeah. So I always wish we don't get too many of those sessions. So. <laughs> But when you do, you think about, yeah, for those families, it is literally a lifetime that you're capturing. It's, it's absolutely amazing. When you do your pictures, I, and I don't know that we've talked about it. I know you do a lot of um, the Now You Lay Me Down and um, some family stuff. Do you do a lot of seniors? Because I'm just thinking yes. about right now. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I mainly do kids, family, and seniors. Um, I have done weddings in the past, but it's really hard to know what my life's going to look like a year in advance. Uh, so being a type A personality, I don't want to feel like I could potentially let somebody down on their wedding day because something happens in my own life. And it goes for anyone. I mean, none of us know, but I just have a very good, you know, there's, there's an opportunity for my family to have some really unknown things happen. And so I never want to let that family down. So any seniors with or upcoming seniors i guess they would be 2021 graduates because your mind just has to go to what a different world they're walking into yeah i really feel bad for 2020 seniors they've had to really adapt but in in a way that's really a great life lesson for them that you know this is life and it happens and uh things don't always just fall into place. So uh, the 2021 seniors are just getting ready to get their pictures taken. And uh, so it'll be interesting 
uh, to see what that looks like, if it looks any different than it has in previous years. And I imagine there'll be a lot of outdoor shots, not, not as many indoor shots, but that's kind of the trend anyway, yeah. What advice would, would 18 year old Sarah give a graduating high school senior now? And how would it be different than wiser 2020 Sarah? I won't say age, <laughs> I'll leave the age out. More for my benefit than, uh, than anything else. But we're talking to folks scholars, they can do the math. Yeah, um, you know, I think it's okay. You know, we all have in the back of our minds what our five-year plan is gonna look like or a 10-year plan, what our plans are for the future. and. And what I had in mind as 18 year old Sarah is very different than 42 year old Sarah. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, really just that it's, a, it's great to have a plan, but it's also great to know that it needs to be fluid and it needs to um, just kind of take shape as it comes about. Because if you are so stuck on that plan, you're just gonna be met with disappointment. And, uh, you can't stay there in that disappointment for long. You've got to keep moving. And sometimes, you know, when we've been in the hospital, that sort of thing, I'd have to tell myself, okay, it's not getting through the day. It's getting through the moment right now. Like we need to get through this moment to get to the next one. And I think that's how it is in life. You know, it's great for us to have a grand plan, but we also have to be fluid enough to move along with it. And, um, that's something that I probably was not as versed in as, as I was I back, back when, when I was, I was 18. 18. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what if there's one thing, so one, I guess I'll say thing, but one, one book, one, um, one reading that you could suggest to um, not only to, to high school seniors or, or um, you know, incoming freshmen, but I guess to the Koch scholars as a whole, what is the the one thing you would be like, this is what you must read right now? So, so one of the one things, things that, that we were are... told about when we were first diagnosed is that we needed to read uh, Welcome to Holland. And it's a really great reading. It's a, it's a poem. And it's about how you are planning for this wonderful trip to Italy. And you're going to see all these sites, and this is what you're anticipating. But your plane diverts, and you end in Holland, and you see maybe some of the yucky stuff or the unexpected things in Holland that you weren't anticipating because you had your heart set on Italy. And but then after time, you start to realize all the beautiful things about Holland, and. Uh, you know, really counting your blessings and, and taking those things in instead of still having your eyes set on on Italy. And I think that's just a really important poem for anyone, whether it's they're facing a diagnosis or uh, they're going off to the big bad world and, uh, you know, they think it's going to be this, but it ends up this. Because I think that so often we can get stuck in our disappointments or unexpectedness and not knowing how to move from them. So, and I'm just looking at a couple of the comments and questions. Yes, Craig, you're right. Um, Sarah has an amazing life journey. <laughs> and, uh, and I see um, on the Facebook side, Justin J. Pearson um, has joined us as well. Thanking you for some incredible advice there about being fluid with what life gives you. And for those of you um, that uh, when you listen to the podcast, any of the six episodes that are coming out, um, the incomparable Justin J. Pearson does the intro for all of them and is absolutely amazing. And, uh, oh, and Will Schultz, Will, another oh. middle of America. Hey, Will. Uh, Will is in Minneapolis. And let's see, Will just said, oh, Stella from Pella and her magic shoe. Yeah, Stella actually has a book that's written about her. And so if you have a kid at home, check out Stella from Pella and Her Magic Shoe. You can purchase it on Amazon. And back in December of 2018, it was actually a bestseller on Amazon. I think every one of our fellow SMA families was buying it and it was a bestseller for like a week. <laughs> If you see me looking back, I'm, I'm like, I know we've got it somewhere. 
like so my daughter's bookshelf is back here so we've got it oh, yeah. goodness i don't know where it is though it's somewhere in here i clearly didn't pull the right one but yeah it's amazing yeah it's a fun book and and we're really thankful to matt morgan and the illustrator who uh put that together he actually uh met us and just in one meeting uh this story about stella came to life so it's really quite remarkable how the book took shape and I'm really, really proud of, of how it turned out and how he wrote it. I'm looking through some of our other comments here. Okay, I'm going to assume this is Daria in, in one of these comments here that said, yes, Sarah, adversity builds resilience. Congrats, 2020 seniors. And I'm guessing it's Daria, if you if it's right, Daria, tell me I'm right because I, I believe you are one of our first families that is both um, a scholar and then your child has now become a Coca-Cola scholar. Um, either that or uh, somebody else that isn't, oh, oh, Jane just said it is. President ha has President Hopkins uh, has confirmed it is Daria. <laughs> Carolyn double confirming. So uh, uh, yeah, Daria, congratulations to you because you are um, one of, of two Coca-Cola parents that now is the parent of a scholar, but she's so right. Yeah, that, that adversity and that strength. And I think your, your life journey speaks to it. Oh, okay, yes, Daria, 1992. Welcome to the 90s. I'm trying to make my three-year-old daughter listen to 90s music. <laughs> <laughs> we were making her listen to, I don't remember what it was today. And she was like, no, Muppet Babies. I was like, no, the 90s. This is the greatest generation, like the greatest decade of music you will ever hear. And then she uh, she disagreed and wanted Muppet Babies. So we were off to Super Fabulous with Miss Piggy. So My 15-year-old my actually likes my music. So I am proud of that fact. You have won every parenting. <laughs> like, I think the ultimate thing in parenting is if your child, well, okay, I have, I have a little bit, um, you know, obviously getting through the day-to-day -day hurdles, right? Yes. But when your kids agree with you on music, you have, and not as if I didn't know you've already done a lot right in the mom <laughs> game, Sarah. <laughs> I love it when he says, have you heard this one, mom? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then you you don't tell the backstory of like when you first heard it. Oh no! On some of mine, I was like, ooh, if I had to tell when I first heard it, that would ruin it. That would ruin the whole thing. Yeah, it, it would involve probably driving down an empty-ish main street in a very very small town, thinking we were cool. <laughs> Which, yes. In hindsight, we weren't, but we thought we were. Of course. Yeah. Uh, let's see who else we, oh, Jamie Williams. I should have known Jamie Williams is obviously a Muppet Babies fan. Nice. Yeah. Um, and Carolyn, Liberty and Bon Jovi. Uh, so my daughter's name is Liberty. And uh, yeah, she's, uh, yeah, she might like Bon Jovi. She's also into a lot of folk music. Uh, Elizabeth Mitchell. She loves Elizabeth Mitchell and Lauren Daigle. Nice. So, so those are, oh, those are both really good too. Oh yeah. Um, but they're they're always really good. What you know? What is it like for you? Um, I think about as a parent, and granted, I just have one child. But when you when you have more than one child, and you have a child that has um, you know so many medical needs, how do you how do you balance all of that? And that's it's probably the mom in me more than the scholar asking asking that question, and probably not asking it well either. Yeah, it's definitely um, because my kids are only about two years apart. So we've got a 15, 13, and 11 year old now. But back in the day, when we brought home our third child, I cried because <laughs> I'm like, how are we going to do this? So um, again, it's really balanced. And when people offer to help, you take that offer. So we are fortunate that we do have some nursing care for Stella. So that definitely helps and allows me to have dates with my <laughs> sons. We can't call it play dates anymore. No, that wouldn't be cool, right? <laughs> and since the other two are boys, the way to their hearts is through their stomach. So, you know, we go to the ice cream shop or whatever. And, but you do have to really cultivate that relationship with them 
because you don't know what they're thinking about the situation. Um, as Stella has grown up and they've grown up, they've learned more about the disease itself and what could happen. And so you have to be really honest about that, but they also have a lot of hope. And that's something I really am thankful that they have. They also are very kind hearted and I'm thankful for that too. How do you think they're, they're, better and I'm going to you know you know put that presumption there that they are right. that they are better people um because of what you've all gone through. Yeah they definitely count their blessings I think. Uh, when they see those in need they can relate to that. And I still remember when my son saw an ambulance going down the road and his friend was laughing about it. And he says, we need to stop. We need to pray for those people right now. And so just that just makes my heart just melt that he knows that they're experiencing the worst day of their life. And he's been there. And hopefully they'll always carry that with them and know to reach out to others. Do you think it has your family's journey has shaped what their career or life path will be? I don't, you know, or do either of them you think will go into you know, medicine or research or anything like that? It's interesting because our oldest has said for years that he's going to find a cure for SMA. So ever since he was probably about five and every Halloween costume was a doctor's jacket with a vial of something. And um, so I do think that he's headed that direction a little bit, but I'm not sure. And the other, he's very artistic. I have no idea. <laughs> so, but I definitely think that they'll always carry it with them in whatever they do and try to help others. So. And a couple of little reminders I'm going to do. I know we've seen a couple of comments. Yes. Daria and, and Carolyn talking about just empathy. And I think, um, That's the word. it's, yeah. it's, it's so important. Um, and for the scholars that have been through LDI, you, you did LDI, um, I think last year, 2019, you were a facilitator. I went to the leader, the leadership summit. Yep. Uh, the LDI yeah. for the Coke scholars for the Coke weekend. You were supposed to do it this year, to right? Me. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, so for older scholars, um, there is now something uh, where we call it LDI. So during your scholars weekend where the rest of us, we interviewed and we still got to do all the other great things, right? We drank the Beverly, well, but we still did, right? We went to World of Coke, we drank the Beverly <laughs> um, and we got to do all those fun things. Well, the uh, this in the last, I think, six, seven years, we've uh, we've revamped it. So then scholars get a leadership development um, weekend, part of the weekend. And it is just an incredible curriculum. And one of the things that is fundamental to that is the power of empathy and vulnerability. Um, and I think, you know, Sarah, your life story just speaks to that. Um, what being vulnerable can do. And in, in putting yourself out there and and the power it can fuel in in people and in, and in yourself absolutely and i think just trying to find that joy in whatever situation is kind of hard sometimes so again it's putting one foot in front of the other and you know life is how we respond to it so and I know we're getting up, we're kind of inching up here on the end of time um, of our of our hour and our chat. Of course, if anyone wants to listen to more of our conversation, it's in the most recent Coke Scholars podcast, The Sip, um, which you can find wherever you find podcasts, wherever you choose to to get your podcast from. Just search for Coke Scholars. Um, you'll you'll find it there. But so, Sarah, this is one of the things that amazes me with you. And as we're wrapping up, um, Tell me what a typical day is like for you. What time, you know, in my mind, you never sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but give me give me a typical day and how you just get through it all. Other than, of course, I know, you know, a lot of caffeine, right? Yes, yes. So I'm actually a real late night person. So I often work ambulance overnight. 
So I'll do a 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. type of thing. So then when I come home, I do have some nursing care in place to help me out there. Um, spending time with each of the boys and making sure I'm checking in with them, not just letting them go play on electronics during quarantine, which has become a battle. <laughs> hey, parenting in quarantine is a whole other world. You, the, yes. the, the rules that were, they're out. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, just prepping all of Stella's stuff. She has about a 20 ingredient mix of food that has to go through her feeding tube. She has respiratory treatments, um, just a whole host of things that have to happen during the day. And those are done morning and night, but then as needed throughout the day. So really just making sure that's all taken care of, um, the nurse is okay, and then um, going out and doing whatever I need to photography-wise. So and then I will in. say I'm not the best cook in the world. <laughs> Oh, so there is something you don't do well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. That makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> and somewhere in all of that, you take a nap. I really, I really <laughs> fail at that. <laughs> all right. So on that note, because I think sometimes embracing our failures is is it is a learning experience. Yeah. Um, what is the thing that you have tried to make that you are absolutely the worst at? It has turned out just beyond atrocious. Food wise. Yeah. So you're going to laugh, but okay. my son says, I do not write, make, sorry, I'm hearing echo. I do not make ramen noodles right. I make slimy noodles. That is impressive. Isn't it? That's, <laughs> sometimes it is a mind. skill not doing something well. <laughs> I can do a lot of other cooking things, but apparently I cannot do that right. <laughs> Uh, well, full disclosure on my end, I've actually never made ramen noodles, so <laughs> well, I probably can't judge. You got through college without them? I did. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I don't even know. I oatmeal packets. That's how I got through oatmeal packets. Which even then, I That's better. Go. Yeah, yeah. My 4-H uh, cooking is what uh, where all my 4-H <laughs> skills, my baking skills, came from and, and learned from. So, oh, parting words great. of advice for for those that have joined us. Um, we are in, we're just in such a, you know, when you say it time and time again, and it runs through my mind, we've never lived through a time like this. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I wake up every morning and I think this world is not what I, what any of us thought it would be. Um, what, what words of advice or wisdom do you have um, that kind of help steady you um, in uncalm waters? for me is whatever happened the day before, wherever I felt I failed or wasn't productive or whatever, um, each day is a new day and I just always like to concentrate on the dash. You know, we have a birth and a death date and I know it's cliche, but where are we going to do with that dash? And for me personally, it's, I am thankful to have a story of hope and you know a love and a perseverance for my daughter and you have an opportunity to stay to write that story so what are you going to do with it i love it and your story is absolutely amazing and there is so much more to it so for anyone um that that uh heard part of this wants to hear more you're right carolyn that is mic drop all the way there <laughs> Um, be sure and check out cheerleaders. I, Carolyn is an amazing <laughs> cheerleader. Um, yes, check yes. out our podcast, um, our conversation, and there's six all together in this first season. Um, Sarah and I chat um, in episode three, and you can find it anywhere you find your podcast. So um, just search for Coke Scholars, and you will find find that, um, or you can go to cokeurl.com slash the sip. So C O K E U R L dot C O M slash. I don't know why I hand motion there. I don't even know if it was right. <laughs> slash slash, whichever way you want to go. Uh, the sip. <laughs> I don't know. What it, um, yeah. And for anyone that's joined us that uh, is interested in applying to be a Coke scholar. And I saw, I saw somebody that was a 2020 scholar just joined <gasps> Lucas. 
who is a new Coca-Cola scholar from the class of 2020. But if you are interested <laughs> in being a Coca-Cola scholar, uh, or if your kids are, um, thinking uh, Daria, who uh, who is now a uh, mom of a Coke scholar, um, all you need to do is head over to Coca-Cola dash uh, or coca dash cola scholars foundation.org we're putting that dash in there again right i think that speaks to the dash two there uh, so it's c-o-c-a dash c-o-l-a-s-c-h-o-l-r-a-s-f-o-u-n-d-a-n-t-i-o-n.org did i get it i think i got it lauren or someone will correct me um, <laughs> if i misspelled it um and applications will open up in August of this year uh, for high school seniors. So if you are the class of 2021, um, those applications open up in August and they close um, usually the end of October, but the sooner you get it in, the better. Um, but Coke scholars sometimes are so busy, they unintentionally procrastinate, but look for that in August. To my wonderful and amazing friend, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you to everybody that joined in for being our guinea pigs as we were trying out multi-screen platform, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, trying to expand the reach for our Coke family. Because I think when we talk about our scholars family, um, we are in so many places doing so many things and we're really trying to be sure that we can um, provide as many connection points as we can. And so that was one of the hopes with the podcast, but then also these conversations as well. So thank you everybody. Um, check out the podcast, check out um, Sarah's amazing work. She's over on Facebook as well with um, her photography studio. And I'm sure if you friend her, you can follow along uh, with Stella's journey as well. And I will be back here taking over over the Instagram and the interwebs um, with one more guest that I'm excited for all of you to meet, one of the other new members of the class of 2020 and our conversation um, here in a couple of weeks. So thank you everybody, Sarah, thank you. Stay well, thank stay you. healthy um, and stay caffeinated, I think is fair. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, thanks, thanks everybody. Guys.